So I just want to point out to everybody, thank you, that last time, last class, sorry for being late, I might have misled some of you on one of your homework problems, um, and I said something that wasn't true. You might have missed it because I said it very kind of briefly, um, but I did say that problem two probably had complex eigenvalues. I was mistaken um, because I accidentally misread this. I thought the matrix for this would have been 2, 2, negative 3, 0. I missed that that was an x2 there instead of an x1. So if this was your matrix, I do think you'd have complex eigenvalues. We could look at that later if we really want to. But I just want to ask everybody, not, not the person who already talked to because you already know the answer. Most of you probably know the answer anyway. If you look at this matrix without doing any work, what are the eigenvalues? Two and negative three. And we know they're two and negative three because there's a zero in one of those off diagonal corners. So if there's a zero there or there or both, then we know automatically that the eigenvalues are the diagonals. And just to be super extra duper clear, when I say the diagonals, I mean the elements on the diagonal. That is the diagonal of the matrix. It's always from the upper left to the lower right corner. For a square matrix. I mean, for any matrix, really. But like, you know, you really talk about diagonals for a square matrix. So it is pretty common. It's pretty common for teachers to give at least one or two questions where it's really easy. Like, oh, I'm just going to make it super easy to find the eigenvalues. So, for example, if I gave you a question like this, in fact, I'm not just going to say if I did, let me give you this question. So, I want you to classify the what's, the, what's the language I want to use here? Sorry. Let me make sure I say this the right way. Sure. What are my papers? There we go. Sure. Um, sure, classify the equilibrium for this, this system. Uh, let's see, dx1 dt equal to negative 3x1 plus 5x2 and dx2 dt equal to negative 6x2. We'll give you 90 seconds. This is too much time to answer this question. You guys on Zoom too. You should be able to tell me pretty quickly. I'll only make the chat private so you can all tell me your answers privately if you want to. Now the chat's private. Sorry, it wasn't before. Um, you also tell me what kind of stability. I have. And got 30 more seconds. You should already know the eigenvalues. All right, so what am I eigenvalues, everybody? Exactly, negative three, negative six, because if we write the matrix, right, just negative three, five, zero, negative six. Oh, yeah, my eigenvalues are definitely negative three and negative six, which means we have a stable, right, because they're both negative. Stable what? A stable node. Or if you a sink, if you want to call it that. So a question like this is meant to be very, very straightforward. Sorry, I'm getting kind of off here. Yeah, right. 
Um, so there's some, like there something else I wanted to mention before we got too into that. No. Um, yeah, so let's go ahead and look back at questions more like question one from your homework assignment, just because I do think those are worth practicing. So am I just going to pick something here? Sure, why not? Let's pick something. Let's pick something kind of easy to start with, and then we'll make it a little bit harder. So let's say we want to, yeah, we want to solve the system. Let's say it's dx1 dt equal to, what did I got? So where'd you go? Yeah, let's make sure. Equal to x1 dx2 dt equal to 4x1 minus x2. We're going to, I always feel like the words are always complicated here. We're going to solve the system of ordinary differentiations. I would never say ordinary, I would say linear, but that's fine. Solve the system. So write the matrix. Our matrix is, I mean, the matrix is always like, okay, no big deal. Our matrix is one, zero, or negative one. Great, we already know tons of stuff. You guys should all be able to tell me if you think about it for just one second. Do we have a node, a saddle, or a spiral? Oh, actually, I was, I was gonna, I was gonna, but yeah, sure. Hey, Sue, so what do we have? Is it a saddle? It's a saddle. Well, it, I want to be, I want, I want, I want a more specific answer, but you're not wrong. Someone else want to say why it's a saddle? Yeah. Right, because not, it's not just that these numbers are opposite signs, but those numbers are the eigenvalues. And yeah, they have, there's one positive and one negative, exactly. So our eigenvalues are one and negative one. And yeah, we know that when your eigenvalues are real and opposite signs, you have to have a saddle. Now we're not done with this question because this question, oh yeah. What if they're both negative? Would it still be a saddle? It would not be a saddle. If they're both negative, we're back in the situation here. So if they're both negative, we have a stable node, a single. Um, and again, right? So there's a couple ways you can see this. You can look at the graph. And by looking at the graph, I mean you can use a graphing utility to graph it. But you can also see this from the general solution. So yeah, we'll, we'll actually, we'll find the general solution for both of these. Why not? This one probably isn't too terrible, but we'll, we'll do this other one first. So I want to find the general solution. I know what that is. Well, actually, I need to know one more thing before I know what that is. What do I need besides the eigenvalues? Okay. Fortunately, when your eigenvalues are easy to find like this, your eigenvectors are also not too terrible to find. So let's find for lambda one equal to one. We're going to solve a times v1, which I'm going to call xy. I could call it x1, x2, but I'm never going to do that. I'm going to call it xy every time just because that's the way I do it. Do we look? So no, that's an excellent question. Do we always look at a and b for the eigenvalues? No, no, no. That's, that's a really good point. It only is true that those are the eigenvalues if you have a zero there or there. So just let me make sure everyone's clear. If our matrix on the other hand was something like A equal to one, two, three, four, the eigenvalues for this matrix are not one and four. It's a really, really good question. We have to actually do the work then. So we only, get to, we only get to take this shortcut if we have a zero in the upper right corner or in the lower left corner. Okay. So yeah, you can use the quadratic formula if there's no zero, or you can also, yeah, there's a couple of different ways to do it, but it essentially it's being the quadratic formula. Yeah. Um, oftentimes we factor instead of using the quadratic formula because most of the, uh, a lot of the time, they're going to try and make problems where it factors if they're nice and real. On the other hand, if they're complex eigenvalues, you're definitely going to do the quadratic formula for sure. So let's see, I'm going to solve this. I get x equal to x. That's not super helpful. So let's use the second row. I get 4x minus y equal to y. So it looks like I've got 4x equal to 2y or 2x equal to y. 
So it looks like my eigenvector is x is one, y is two. Okay, let's find the other eigenvector. I'm pretty sure, although we'll see for sure in a second here, when you have your eigenvalues nice like this, meaning they're easy to find because you have a zero in one of the corners there, typically one of the eigenvectors has a zero in one of the spots. Like I feel like that always happens. I've noticed this after a few years of seeing these things. But let's double check. If I do one, zero, four, negative one times x, y equal to negative one times x, y. Yeah, look what's going to happen. In the first row, you get x equal to negative x. And the only number that that's true for is x equal to zero, which means y has to be any number you want except for zero, which we usually take as being one. I see people looking at this like, what kind of voodoo magic did James just do over there? So I just want to make sure everyone's right. So let's actually check it. If you actually plug that vector back in, one, zero, four, negative one times zero, one equals one times zero plus zero times one, and four times zero plus negative one times one, which is exactly negative one times the eigenvector. You should get really, really comfortable with saying that, oh yeah, if you're trying to find the eigenvector and one of the variables is zero, the other one has to be one. Technically, you can pick any non-zero number you want, but everyone's going to pick one. So now we have all the pieces to write our solution. Well, almost. I forgot one piece that's important, which is in the book here. I forgot the initial condition. Our initial condition is also that x sub zero as a vector, let me not see that, is three, two. That's our initial condition, right? Yeah. Okay. So now we're going to throw all of this stuff we found into the formula. What formula, you ask? The only formula, not the only this formula, that the solution x as a vector is equal to c1 e to the lambda 1 t times v1 plus c2 e to the lambda 2 t times v2. And yeah. So really, we just take all the things we found and plug them in. So as a vector, we're going to get c1 e to the lambda 1 was 1 times t, and v1 was 1, 2. And c2 e to the lambda 2 was negative 1, and v2 was 0, 1. Great. And now we're going to use the initial condition, the x of 0 is equal to three, two. That just means that X evaluated at zero is three, two. I would again, emphasize the fact that when you have a zero in one of these corners, upper right or lower left, usually things are kind of easy because we're gonna be able to really easily solve for C1 and C2 here. Because when you have a zero in a corner, you typically get an eigenvector that has a zero in one of the spots. So when I'm trying to plug in zero, so I'm plugging in zero for T, I'm gonna get X of zero, which is three, two, which is equal to C1 E to the zero is one, and one, two plus C2 times E to the zero is one, and zero, one. And show me on your fingers or type it in the chat. You guys should all be able to tell me with just a glance, what's C1 equal to? You see those fingers? Tell me in the chat. Yeah, yeah, good, 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 good. It's definitely three, right? C1 has to be three because three times one plus, it doesn't matter what this is times zero, has to equal three. 
So once you've got a zero in one of these spots, it's super, super easy to find one of those constants. So C1 has to equal three. And then it's not a whole lot more work to find what C2 is, because then we can see that C1 times two plus C2 times one equals two. But we know that that's three right there. So two equals six plus C1. So C1 equals negative four. See, there's a question. Clarify what we need to do. So we'll do it. We'll do one like that next. So we'll definitely do one where there aren't zeros in the diagonal. Um, so then our gen or our, sorry, our this is our general solution right there. That's your general solution. And your particular solution using the given initial condition is just the same thing with the C1 and C2 values written in. So it's going to be 3e to the t times 1, 2. I should really write this as equal to x1 of t, x2 of t. Or if you prefer, you can write it just as the vector notation x of t. Um, plus C2, e to the negative t, 0, 1. That's our particular solution. Oh, sorry, you were correct. That, 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 yeah, sorry, I wrote C1 there, but that is definitely C2. Apologies. Good, good eye. Thank you. Yeah, both of you. Yes, excellent. Good job. Keep me on my toes. Um, Again, we already said this, but I just want to point out this system, the equilibrium is an unstable set. And so I want to talk more about that really, just, just a little. So you'll see that as t goes to infinity, this part's going to grow infinitely large, and this part's going to grow infinitesimally small, because e to the negative infinity gets super, super small, and e to the positive infinity gets really, really big. Here's yeah, sorry, there's just so many things to kind of see about this. I'm trying to like be efficient here, but I want to show you one or two things about this just so you guys are all super clear about it. Um, if I was going to try and draw this system of solutions like as a, as a phase plane, as a vector field, so there's a couple things I want. And has he talked? So I should ask you, has he talked much about the eigenlines? It's okay if the answer is no. I'm seeing mostly no. Has he talked about the null flying? Okay, that's perfectly fine. So I'm not going to say too much then. So I'm, I am going to draw the eigenlines. The eigenlines are not hard to draw. They're just the lines that the vector lives on. So this vector one, two, I'm just going to draw the line from the origin to that point and then and continue it. And since it's associated with a positive eigenvalue, we know that along that line, we move away from the origin, from the equilibrium. And then the other eigenline is the one associated with the vector 0, 1, which goes with the point 0, 1, which is literally just the line x equals 0, which is how we got the eigenvector in the first place. And since that eigenline has an eigenvalue that is negative, we are moving towards. Okay, so I'm going to show you two things here. Thing one, if we start at our actual initial condition, which is x equal to three and y equal to two, which is about right there. So what's happening over here is we're in this region where we're getting pushed up and we're getting pushed to the right. So we're going to kind of go something like that. We're getting pushed way away from our equilibrium point here, right? We're seeing instability. You could actually, if you wanted to, if you actually plugged in two for x and three for y back into your original 
differential equations, which I know it's been forever since we looked at them. I'll remind you that the originals were dx dt equal to x and dy dt. Okay, I used x1 and x2 before, but it's okay. If I plug in three for x and two for y, I get dx dt equal to three and dy dt equal to 12 minus two is 10. So I'm going like at this point right here, I'm going three right and 10 up. Yeah, that seems not like, that looks like that slope could be like three right and 10 up. So that's the idea. At that point, we're moving that way. The tiny keeps going that way. Now, you could also see this. Sorry. You know me, I show you the graphs. Oh, that's not, sorry, that's not the right one. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. It's hard. I looks like I bookmarked something I didn't mean to there. Um, but we can also just check this out really quick. X and four times X minus Y. Graph it. And we start over here at the point one, two, three, one, two. You can kind of see that same. I mean, right, I didn't draw perfectly because I couldn't if I wanted to, but you can kind of see, oh yeah, we were definitely getting pushed away from the origin. No matter where we start with one kind of wild exception, we're getting pushed towards the origin. So looking back at, sorry, go away. Looking back at our particular solution, you can see that. You can see that, well, yeah, as T goes on and on and on and on, we're going to get this part blowing up and this part becoming not very useful. Now, here's the only exception to this. If we started on this line where the eigenvector is pointing, or the eigenline is pointing in, right, all of our directions pointing toward the origin this eigenline where the eigenvalue is negative. So let me actually back up and say, let's pick some different initial conditions. Let's have our initial condition be x equals zero, y equals three. Or if you prefer, x of zero is zero, three. So I'm starting right up there at zero, three. Here's what's gonna happen. I'm sorry, you have to do it. We're going to get pushed towards the origin. So in this one line, you actually have stability. But let's actually see it from the equation perspective. So here's our general equation again. X of t equals c1 e to the t times 1, 2 plus c2 e to the negative t times 0, 1. And my c1 and c2, we could do the work. I'm just going to tell you the answer. C2 is going to be three and C1 is going to be zero if this is my initial condition. Or you could actually plug it in or you could set it equal to zero, three, or that's just one and that's just one. And you'd be like, oh yeah, C2 times zero, one being zero, three has to be a three there, but then that's going to be nothing there. But you can't have C1 be anything because then you'll get a non-zero spot up there. So C1 equals zero. C2 equals three. And here's the solution for this starting point, for this initial condition. It's just this vector. It's just the C2 times e to the negative t times zero, one. And for this initial condition, what happens as time goes on? Oh, as time goes on, what happens to e to the negative t? It's small. So this goes to zero, zero as time goes on. So if you start, if you start here, you end up getting pushed towards the equilibrium point because you're on the one line of stability. But if you start anywhere else, you get pushed away because you then you have some portion of this vector that doesn't just go to zero. So it's kind of neat. So that's why we say generally 
a saddle is unstable because unless you happen to start in this very particular place, you're going to push off to infinity in some direction. But yes, yeah, so let's answer the, the more challenging type of question. What if we don't have a zero in one of those corners? Which, to be honest, is going to be the case most of the time. Let's take a look. Yeah, question. So what would you so well what do you mean by touch is the origin exactly? Like and by so by stable you mean like a stable node? No, like unstable. Yeah, an unstable node. Uh, because they don't go out. Uh-huh. Like I'm assuming you're saying like he's giving you like a graph of like a vector field. Yeah. Like sorry, where'd you go? Like something like that. So good question. Really good question. Um, yeah, it's kind of hard to tell with this one to be perfectly honest. Um, because, well, so here's the thing. When you have, so let me just give you, let's do another one that I know is going to be unstable. All right, let me just make it real easy. Yeah, it's not super clear. I feel like that's a hard question to answer. It's, so, so it's hard to see it just from the graph, but so yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying to be like, so, so, so yeah. It's not always easy to tell. Um, yeah, I don't have a great answer to that question. I feel like no matter where we start here, you're always kind of going away in both. So, so the difference is for a unstable node, like a source, like same thing, but you're kind of going away no matter what direction you're talking about. Whereas for a set of saddle points, some directions kind of push you towards the origin, but then you eventually shoot off away. So like here, no matter where I pick, I should be moving away from the origin. And I am in kind of a very roundabout way. But I definitely am always moving away from the origin. Whereas with the previous example, right, we are we're moving away, but more in kind of a glancing way. Like you're kind of you're kind of veering in and then you're moving away. But I know that's I know I'm not doing an excellent job of explaining it, but that's kind of the best I've got. If you've just got the graph like this. It's kind of hard to tell. I mean, it's, it's not like super hard to tell, but it's not always easy. That's I, I, I'll think I'll think about it some more and see if I can come up with a better answer to that. But that's what I've got for the moment. Um, someone asked, how did I come up or can I explain how I got C1 equal to zero and C2 equal to three? Sure. So I made it up in a way that I knew what I was going to get what I wanted. But if you look at this here, so if I'm trying to solve this equation, right, I'm setting, right, I'm setting t equal to zero, right? That's my t equal to zero. And so when I solve this, I get c1 times e to the zero, which is one, times one, two, c2 times e to the zero, which is one times zero, one. So I really have c1 times one, two, plus c2 times zero, one, equal to zero, three. And now here's the thing. Having a zero right there absolutely means that C, C1 has to be zero. Well, I should, uh, I should back a little bit. Having a zero there and a zero there means that C1 has to be zero. So C1 is not zero, I get a not zero times one, and then I can't get zero over there. So that's how I know that C1 has to be zero. And then I know C2 has to be three because three times one is going to give me three. That's how. And again, both this example and the previous example we did for finding the constants, right? They were fairly easy. They were made, they were made to be easy. The next one's not going to be quite so easy. So let's look at another example of actually solving the whole system of differential equations. Um, trying to think about something for a second. Yeah, I'll be fine. Okay. Well, let's do this one. Let's look at. 
the matrix is A equals a negative one, two, negative three, negative one. And our initial condition is two, zero. I'll be honest, I picked one from the book. I haven't checked it. It might turn out to be terrible. If it turns out to be terrible, we might move on. Well, let's go ahead and find the eigenvalues. So this is where we actually have to do work, right? The eigenvalues are not negative one and negative three. At least they're probably not. It's possible you could make up something if you really, really tried, but we'll, I highly doubt it. So I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do it the other way. I'm gonna do determinant the other way, meaning the kind of original way. Determinant of A minus lambda I equal to zero. So I'm gonna have the determinant of negative one minus lambda, two, negative three, negative one minus lambda. And I have a feeling I'm going to need some imaginary eigenvalues. So that's okay. We can move on, or we can do it if you guys really want to. Let's find out. So I'm going to have negative one minus lambda times another negative one minus lambda minus two times negative three. Okay, so let's see here. We're going to get the multiply this out. It's going to be lambda squared. Um, let's see plus lambda plus lambda is plus two lambda plus one minus minus six is plus six equal to zero. So I've got lambda squared plus two lambda plus seven equal to zero. Okay, not pretty. So we definitely can't factor that, right? They've, I think they've made this one like as obviously unfactorable as possible because there's no way you can multiply the seven and add the two. At least not with integer numbers. Let's go ahead and use the quadratic formula. So our eigenvalues are going to be negative two plus or minus the square root of two squared minus four times one times seven, all over two, which is going to give me a negative two plus or minus the square root of, let's see, four minus 28 is negative 24. And that's going to end up being. I feel like we might have done this particular one before. Um, square root of negative 24 is going to be i root 24, but 24 is 4 times 6, so it's going to be a square root of 4, which is 2, so it's going to be 2i root 6. And then that ends up being negative 1 plus or minus i root 6. And I am fairly confident we actually did this example before. I might have accidentally picked the same one from the book, although it's possible I just made up one that had the same roots. So we're not, let's go ahead and not actually find the whole system because remember finding the system for, or the solution for complex eigenvalues is a real giant pain. Not that we should never do it. We did do one last time, but that's not the best way to spend our time. But we should talk about, um, geez, the words just fail me these days. I'm sorry, we should talk about analyzing it. So analyze slash classify. All right, so stable or unstable? Oh, stable or unstable? Stable because the real part is negative. So it's definitely stable. But even the fact that I said the real part of something implies that it's complex or imaginary meaning we have what sort of shape? Spiral. So we have a stable spiral. And then we could talk about the direction of the spiral. I know I said things last time about what it meant if you had a positive here or a negative here. I literally don't remember which one it is because it's never something I've had been able to memorize. It's just like, I know it's one way or the other. So since I don't remember what I'm gonna do instead, so I'm going to draw a little picture. And I'm going to plug in points like 1, 1, and negative 1, 1, and negative 1, negative 1, and 1, neg 1, negative 1 to my system of differential equations, right? Because really what this means here is dx dt equals negative x plus 2y, and dy dt equals negative 3x minus y. So if I plug in 1, 1, what do I get? Well, dx dt is going to be 
negative one plus two. And dy dt is going to be negative three minus one. So at the point one, one, I'm going one right and four down. I'm kind of going that way. Already, I'm pretty sure that the answer is going to be clockwise. Right? It looks like I'm going in a clockwise kind of thing, but just, just from the way that one's pointing. It's way more confusing if your first one's pointing like this. Then it's kind of like, uh, um, here's kind of the real, here's the way I actually kind of think about it. I'm mean, not that this isn't happening, but, but to be a little more specific. If I was doing this kind of graphical analysis and I started at the point one, one, here's the line that's important. Y equals X. So here's the deal. If from one, one, my vector is going anything like this, that's clockwise. Because it's in some way to perform, I'm eventually going to be going around the origin that way. Whereas if I happen to be on the other side of the line y equals x, like that, or like that, or like that, or like that, that's going to be counterclockwise. Because as I start following that around, I'm like, oh, I'm that way, but I'm more, I'm more up than I am right. So I'm going to eventually kind of circle back around that. Way. But really, it's probably easy to just memorize the thing that I can memorize. So I think, and I'm pretty sure, having looked at this, that okay, I'm pretty sure it's clockwise. I'm pretty sure when it's positive here, it's clockwise. Hopefully, that corresponds to what I said last time. Because I literally don't remember. Um, yeah, let's look at a, let's look at an example that's actually going to work out a little bit more nicely. Let's see here. Move that one forward. Sure, let's do that. Okay, so that was here. So let's look at a system like this. Well, that could be interesting. No, we should save that. Oh, um, no, I don't think so. So someone asked, we definitely have to state the direction of the spiral when it says to analyze and classify. Um, maybe, typically not, but your professor might want you to. So really it's something it's at your, pre your professor will hopefully say if they want you to do that. Normally people don't ask for it, but if you could, so you should be aware of that. Really the most the way people would usually find it is just by drawing a few points. So that's what I would really, if I was trying to show my work for that, I would still draw the points. I might also in the back of my mind have memorized the rule so that I know that even if I draw it poorly, it's still going to come out to be like, I'm sort of like, okay, I know which way it's supposed to go. So that's what I would do. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Sure. Let's do that one. Let's say that our matrix is. I'm all like, sorry. I want to make sure it doesn't come out to be really, really terrible like last time. Sorry, let me work it. Let me let me do a little bit of extra math over here. One second. Um, I want my matrix. That'll work. Yeah. So let's say we have our matrix is. Let's try that one. And let's have some initial conditions. Just gonna make something up. That always goes so well. Okay. So let's go ahead and solve the system. So we're gonna do all the things. We're gonna find the eigenvalues. And we can do it either way. We can do the trace determinant method or we can do the determinant of A minus lambda I. The thing about the trace determinant method is you are automatically using the quadratic formula. Whereas if you do it this way, you might see an easier way of factoring. So that's going to be the determinant of this 
So that's going to equal two minus lambda times three minus lambda minus two minus e to the zero. Let's say I'm going to get a lambda squared minus three lambda minus two lambda is minus five lambda plus six minus two equals zero. That's lambda squared minus five lambda plus four. That's going to be lambda minus four and lambda minus one. So I'm getting eigenvalues like that. So we already know we have an unstable node. Two positive eigenvalues. Great. So now let's go ahead and find the eigenvectors. So it's a lambda one equal to. I would usually make lambda one the larger one, but it really feels weird to make lambda one equal to four and then lambda two equal to one. So I would pick lambda one equal to one. It doesn't really matter what you call them, but just be consistent. Lambda one is one. So I'm finding the eigenvector. I'm going to have two, one, two, three times my eigenvector equal to one times my eigenvector. And let's see, what have I got? I've got two X plus Y equal to X. So I've got Y equal to negative X. So it looks like one negative one is a solid choice for the eigenvector. And then for lambda two equal to four, I've got the same equation, except there's a four instead of a one. So two, one, two, three times X, Y equals four times X, Y. And then I'm gonna have two X plus Y equal to four X. So Y is gonna equal two X. So it looks like one, two is my choice for eigenvector here. Okay. Now we're going to write this, the general solution. So the general solution is going to be, again, x is a vector equal to c1e to the lambda 1t, c1 plus c2e to the lambda 2t. I really do recommend writing it out just like that, just because it's pretty easy to memorize this way. You really only have to memorize this first piece and then just repeat it with twos instead of ones for the second part, right? It's not that bad. So that's going to be C1e to the 1t times 1 negative 1 plus C2e to the 4t times 1, 2. OK. And then we're going to find the c's by plugging in our initial conditions. So when t equals 0, we have that the vector is three one. So we have that three one equals C one times E to the, this, this part always goes away, right? When you're finding, the, when you're using the initial condition, you're always plugging in zero for T. So this part's always just gonna be gone. So it's C one times one negative one plus C two times one two. And now it gets a little more challenging to find C1 and C2. There are a number of ways you can do this. Yeah, here's what I would do. So I would write out both equations. So three equals C1 plus C2, and one equals negative C1 plus two C2. And then I'd look for an easy thing to do. In this case, it feels like the easy thing to do would be adding the equations to each other. That's when we cancel out the C1s. So if you add these, you get three plus one equal to no C1 plus three C2. So it looks like C2 is going to be four thirds. And then you can plug that back in over here to figure out what C1 is going to be. So I probably plug it in here and say, okay, then C1 is going to equal three minus four thirds, which is nine thirds minus four thirds, which is five thirds. So the general or the particular solution for this initial condition is going to be x of t equal to c1, which is 5 thirds, e to the t times 1 negative 1, plus c2, which is 4 thirds, 
times e to the 4t times 1 2. That is your particular solution. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I can definitely show the whole page. Apologies. There you go. Um, something I wanted to say here. I will say so as long as your eigenvalues, eigenvalues, yeah, I mean not. So as long as your eigenvalues slash eigenvectors are nice meaning integers or maybe fractions at the worst. This is a fine way of finding C1 and C2. But if you happen to have eigenvectors slash eigenvalues that are either irrational or even worse, complex, finding C1 and C2 is a real pain. And I probably wouldn't recommend this particular method for finding C1 and C2, where you just kind of write out the equations and try and solve. There is another way of finding C1 and C2 that's a little more methodical, but it takes a little more effort, which I can show you guys, but it's a kind of a pain. I mean, it's not like it's horrible. I just don't know if you need to know it really. All right, let me ask you all. Should we do another example of this? Does it play it out? I see so. Okay, I see yeses. Should I make it so the eigenvalues are not as nice, not imaginary, but like maybe some irrational eigenvalues? Yeah, I think I should. Can't right or at all yeah yeah let me just make sure i don't make it accidentally complex so let's um sure let's try so let me see i want so what i'm really doing is i'm coming up so here's yeah we should oh, we should talk about that yeah we have time we have time so i'm just finding i'm making up a trace in the determinant so that things come out to be sort of this trace squared minus four times Sure, let's say the trace needs to be six and the determinant could be seven. Sure, that will be perfectly fine. Okay, so I want my trace to be six. Sure. There's a trace of six. Here is a determinant of seven. Could we be more exciting? Could we make those negative ones? That might be more interesting. Mm, might not. Let's just leave it like that. Okay, so there's a matrix. We want to find the whole general solution. Um, and I guess we should also talk about some initial conditions. So let's say that, uh, no. Let's say those are initial conditions. All right. So, same process. Um, so, here's the thing I already know that the eigenvalues are not going to be nice. So, you could, you could do it the, the regular way, like determinant of A minus lambda I is the determinant of that. And then you get T minus lambda times four minus lambda minus one, which is going to be lambda squared, minus four lambda minus two lambda is minus six lambda, plus eight minus one, which is lambda squared minus six lambda plus seven. And if you weren't being super careful, you might accidentally think you could factor this, right? You'd be like, oh, seven, negative six, there's probably a way I can make that work to multiply the seven out, right? It seems like within the realm of possibility, it's not. Or you could use the trace determinant method and say, oh yeah, the trace is six. If the determinant is four times two minus one times one, which is seven. It's really the same either way. So check it out, right? My eigenvalues are the trace plus or minus the square root of the trace squared minus four times the determinant all over two. Which in case you guys hadn't noticed, is exactly the quadratic formula for this equation, right? It's the trace, which is negative B plus or minus the square root of, it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative when you square it, B squared minus four times A times C all over two times A. Quadratic formula. So we're gonna get six plus or minus the square root of 
36 minus four times seven all over two, which you can get from there, or you can be like, oh yeah, James, that's your quadratic formula from that equation right there. So here's what we've got for our eigenvalues. We've got six plus or minus the square root of uh, 36 minus 28 is eight all over two. But the square root of eight is really two root two. So it's six plus or minus two root two all over two, which is three plus or minus root two. Those are my eigenvalues. All right, let's classify before we do anything else. So. Well, we know it's not a spiral because it's not imagined. So it's either a sink, a source, or a saddle. Definitely not a sink because at least one of them is positive. Is it a saddle or is it a source? Let's see, three plus root two is positive. Three minus root two is positive. So it's actually a word, an, an unstable node or, an, or, or a state, oh, oh my God. Uh, right, thank you. Yes, it's a source, AKA an unstable node, right? So we don't, usually we don't say unstable source because those kind of go together. It's an unstable node, which is the same, or it's also called a source. And that's because both eigenvalues are positive. Yeah. Yeah, we got time. Okay. So now let's find the eigenvectors, which is definitely less of a nice process than the eigenvalues are anything but nice and good. It's still not undoable. So let's look at it one way. One way we could do the thing where we do the matrix and let's do lambda equals three. Speaking of the matrix, I saw like a, an ad for like a new matrix movie coming out in December. I was like, what? There's another matrix movie? I was a little excited. I remember seeing the first one when I was in college. It was, a, it was a fun time, it's a good movie. If you haven't seen it, I recommend the first one. I'll say nothing about the other two. I mean, they're fine, but you know, whatever. They're not, they're not the first one. Okay, so anyway, back to the problems of math and matrices. Um, we're going to do the matrix 2, 1, 1, 4 times our unknown eigenvector equal to the eigenvalue 3 plus root 2 times the unknown eigenvector. Blah. So let's see what we've got here. Using the first row, I've got 2x plus y. It is nice to have a 1y because at least we can isolate y pretty easily here. I'm equal to three plus root two times X. So, oh, and that's in parentheses here. So if I subtract two X, I have Y equal to what times X? Three X minus two X gives me a one X and the root two still there. But you can distribute this if you wanted to and say it's 3x plus root 2x, and then you could subtract the 2x from the 3x and have a 1x plus a root 2x, which is just 1 plus root 2x. So you really do care about having the coefficient all this kind of one piece. So here my eigenvector could be x is 1 and y is 1 plus root 2. Not everyone's favorite, but it's fine. Let me point out what I think is a slightly maybe easier way to find the eigenvector when it's a less nice eigenvalue. So instead of doing the a times your eigenvector equal to lambda times your eigenvector, I'm instead going to do the other equation for finding the eigenvector, which is a minus lambda i times your eigenvector is equal to the zero vector. I typically find that this equation is easier to solve when your eigenvalues are less nice, meaning irrational or complex. So let's take a look at what we've got. So I'm just going to take my matrix A, 
and I'm subtracting the eigenvalue from the diagonals. It's still not going to be pretty. Um, also, my eigenvalue I'm using for this one is 3 minus root 2. That's the second eigenvalue. So I'm going to do 2 minus 3 minus root 2, 1, 1, 4 minus 3 minus root 2 times xy equal to 0, 0. And I would probably do the small amount of simple thing I could before I actually wrote this out. 2 minus 3 minus root 2 is going to be negative 1 plus root 2. And 4 minus 3 minus root 2 is going to be positive 1 plus root 2. So when I do this row times that column, I get negative one plus root two times x plus y equal to zero. And that's actually much easier to solve for y because I've already got, just got something times x plus something times y equal to zero. So if I just bring this over to the other side, y is going to be negative negative one plus root two times x. Or distributing the minus sign, y equals one minus root two times x. And so my eigenvector here is going to be one, one minus root two. And I think this is true, but I'm not hundred percent sure, but I'm fairly certain that just like how complex eigenvalues come in kind of complex conjugate pairs, meaning all of the imaginary parts change signs. I think that's also true when you have irrational eigenvalues, meaning if one, one plus root two is the eigenvector here, I know the other eigenvector is gonna be the same thing, except you're gonna change the sign of the irrational part. I'm not 100% on that. I'm, I might investigate it more just to be sure. I think that's true. It's something I've seen a lot, but it's something I would look out for if you're doing this. Okay, so now here's our solution to the system. Our solution, once again, is, C, is x of t equal to c1e to the lambda 1t times v1 plus c2t e to the lambda 2t times v2. It's just that everything is less nice now. So now we have that our general solution is going to be C1 e to the, let's see, lambda one was which one? It was the plus one, right? It was three plus root two. So it's gonna be three plus root two times t times v1, which was one, one plus root two, plus C2 e to the three minus root two times t times one, one minus root two. And then, if we want to find C1 and C2, we're going to use our initial conditions, which were, I'll remind you, X of zero equals one, two, which I totally made up and probably going to suck. Let's find out. So let's use a new page because I feel like it's going to take a little bit of room. So if I plug those in, what do I get? Well, let's see. I get one, two equal to C1 e to the zero times my vector plus C2 e to the zero times my vector. All right. So then. Uh, this, so, this, so here's one way you could do it. So you can write the equations. You could say, okay, one equals C1 plus C2. Two equals C1 times one plus root two plus C2 times one minus root two. Hmm. That looks not fun. Um, can we solve this? We should be able to solve this. It's just going to be not nice. So a couple ways you could do this. One way would be to 
isolate one of these variables here and plug it into the other equation. And that's probably what I would do here. Yeah, that probably is what I would do here. So I would say C1 equals one minus C2, and then plug that in there. So then I've got two equal to one minus C2 times one plus root two plus C2 times one minus root two. And then we're going to solve for C2. So multiplying out the right hand side, we get one plus root two minus C2 minus C2 times root two plus C2 minus C2 times root two. And at least something cancels. I'm going to subtract one, I'm going to subtract root two, and then I'm going to be left with minus C2 root two, minus C2 root two, or minus two C2 root two. And then solving for C2, I'm gonna get C2 equal to this, divided by negative two root two. Now I am gonna do a little simplifying here because I probably should. First things first, I'm gonna multiply the top and bottom by negative one, just to make it look a little bit nicer. So I'm really gonna have negative one plus root two over two root two. And then I'm gonna multiply the top and bottom by root two to rationalize my denominator. So I'm gonna have negative root two plus two over two times two, which is four, or two minus root two. Luckily, Finding C1 is really easy once I've got C2. C1 is just one minus C2, which is part of the reason you want to rationalize it to make finding the other thing nice. That's going to be four over four minus two minus root two over four. And that's just going to end up being four minus two is two and a minus minus root two is a plus root two. Not pretty, but not as terrible as I might have led you to believe. So my final general solution is gonna be, sorry, my final particular solution, not general, apologies, is gonna be X of T equal to C1, so two plus root two over four, times E to the three plus root two T, times one, one plus root two, plus C2, which was two minus root two over four, times E to the three minus root two T, times one, one minus root two. How not lovely. Right. Questions about that? I can, I can move this off for a second if you want to see the that work again. Give you a moment. Give myself a moment. Yeah. Like, like, uh, make a list of like the steps if you like, like, uh, like what to do step by step. Like, what would that like as far as like this whole process? Yeah, yeah. sure. So, the whole process for finding general slash particular solution. to a system of differential, I, I should say linear differential equations, which we typically imagine. So, so the particular solution, right? So that's a good question. 
So this is the particular solution because it's only the solution when you're starting at the initial condition, x of zero equals, uh, what did I pick? One, two or two, one? I don't remember. I think it was one, two, right? It's the solution particular to this initial condition. Whereas this general solution, we could kind of make fit any initial condition. So that's why you call this the general solution because it could be the solution to anything or this particular. It's kind of exactly a lot like um, when you have um, the differential equation dy dt equal to k times y. We know that the general solution to that is y equal to ce to the kt. We're pretending like we know k and we don't know c. And then your particular solution is when you actually know how much stuff you start with. So the particular might be, oh, I know at time zero, I have five grams of radioactive material. So my actual particular solution is y equal to five e to the kt, because I know that that's going to be the right solution for this particular initial condition. What is the difference between the question about the stability of the equilibrium? With the, so, so classify means you need to say all the things. So if someone asked me to classify an equilibrium, I would include stability in that answer. Even though they might not actually want it, I don't feel like it's wrong to give too much information there. So if someone said classify, I would say it's one of six things. Okay, there's a seventh thing, but we will talk. I was gonna talk about that today, I think we're not gonna get there. It's not, I saw him in the, so I was looking at his notes. I did see he talked about lambda equal to zero being an eigenvalue in one like short little part. Has he talked about that in class at all? Okay, he said no. Okay, yeah. It's not a big deal, but I did see it in his notes from like a year or two ago. So I thought we can talk about it next time if we want to. Um, but to answer your question, so if someone said stability, you would just say it's stable or unstable, right? If really, now really, I would, no, I would, either way, I would say all the things. I can't, like, I would just be like, it's stable or unstable, and it's a node, or it's a spiral. Or if it's unstable, it could also be a saddle. Um, and then we'd say, so, but yeah, explicit stability, you say stable or unstable, and then classify, you would say, it's either a node, or it's a saddle, or it's a spiral. But really, I think whether you're asked about stability or classifying, I really think it, you should just err on the side of saying both things. I would say what kind of stability you have and what kind of behavior you have. I think that's probably in your best interest. And really, all of that comes from the eigenvalues, right? Once you know the eigenvalues, you know the answers to all those questions, all two of those questions. You know what it looks like, and you know if it's stable or unstable. Okay, so um, the process for doing this, for finding the solution to I wrote the wrong side on the sorry. Right, that's what we're solving. We're finding the solution to the derivative of x and y equal to the equation, right? Which you might think of as like, you know, dx dt equal to ax plus dy, dy dt equal to cx plus dy. Where I'm thinking of the matrix as so step one. Find the eigenvalues. Step two, find the eigenvectors. Step three, write the solution. Step four, find C1 and C2 using the given initial condition, if there is one. It feels so easy when you write down these four simple steps. You're like, hey, you just do this, 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 and this, you're done. 
but obviously, right, each of these steps, maybe not the first one, but most of these steps require a bit of calculation, right? It's not super, super easy to find them, but it's not, it's not conceptually so difficult to do this process, right? You know how to find eigenvalues. You know how to find eigenvectors. Writing this equation is literally just memorizing a thing and then finding the initial, the C1 and C2 is just solving a system of equations. I know I say just like it's super easy. It's not just, but it's in the realm of what you're doing in this class. This is one of the easier things. I know the whole process is kind of large and there's a lot of moving point pieces, but the actual computations you're doing in each of these four steps are on the smaller side of difficult as far as this class is concerned. They're not conceptually super challenging. They're just computationally a bit of work. What I'm trying to say is don't feel overwhelmed by it, right? It's really, if you manage it piece by piece, it's very doable to solve a system of linear differential equations. Most of the time they're, eh, no, that's not true. You will probably, you'll be asked. I mean, obviously there was homework question you're asking, so you will occasionally be asked to find the solution, but more of the time we're more interested in classifying the words, the words, classifying the stability of the equilibrium or, or finding, by determining the stability and classifying it. That's what we're more interested in usually. And the fact that we're going to see later on. So when we start talking about nonlinear systems of differential equations, we won't be finding the solution in general. We won't be doing this x1 equals all this stuff or this x of t. We'll just be saying, well, here's our nonlinear system of differential equations. Here are the not just origin equilibria points. There'll be multiple equilibria. And for each of the equilibrium, equilibria, we can classify what kind of stability we have, whether it's a sink or a source or a saddle or a spiral, whether it's stable or unstable. It's kind of neat. Um, so we have a few minutes left. You guys have a test next Friday. I think, right? That's what someone told me. You're all in the same class, right? Okay, let me sure. You have a test next Friday. Um, also, be appropriate, make sure you felt the attendance form. Um, but you have a test next Friday. Classes don't meet next Thursday. It's a holiday, Veterans Day. No classes meet on Thursday, not just my class, every class doesn't meet on Thursday. So our next class Tuesday is the last class that we have before your test. So I imagine we should probably do some review. So you should think about what you want to hear shoot me an email if there's something particular i did he give you guys a practice stuff last time no okay i'll try and i'll try and cook up something um but that's the plan for tuesdays we'll try and do some sort of review for your test because he said what the test will encompass as far as chapters okay all right well let's have to look for that then um in the last few minutes here there is one other thing i did want to say and that there is this kind of nice way of talking about the solutions of a systems of equation, like of classifying them. There's kind of this, this cool picture that's in your book. It's on page 650 if you have the textbook. Um, but it's kind of neat. So here's what I want to point out. We know that for a matrix, matrix A, which you could call, I don't really care what it's called. We know that the eigenvalues can be found using the trace and the determinant, right? The trace here, A plus B, the determinant, which I usually use delta for, is A times B minus B times C. Oh, let's do this, it's gonna be terrible, maybe not, okay. And the eigenvalues are, and I do think you should probably take the time to memorize the formula. It's really just the quadratic formula with particular values. It's the trace plus or minus the square root of the trace squared minus four times delta over t. Yeah. Yes, definitely next time. Yeah, yeah. That was on my radar, but I had kind of got caught up doing this. So yeah, we can talk about compartment models for sure next time. They're not terrible. They're actually not terrible at all, which is good. Um, so Here's the thing about this. You can look at this, and if you know what the trace and the determinant are, you don't even have to know the eigenvalues to actually find what your system is doing. 
you could, right? I mean, if you, obviously, if you know the trace of the term, it's not a big step to then find the eigenvalues. You just plop them into the formula and the eigenvalues. But we can see a couple things. Well, one, here's one thing we know. If the determinant is negative, you know we have a saddle automatically. Here's the way you can see that with this formula. If the determinant is negative, this stuff inside the square root just got bigger because it's a negative times a negative, which is positive. So this stuff inside the square root is bigger than the trace squared, meaning the square root of this is bigger than the trace. So if you take the trace, if the trace is positive, then the trace minus the number bigger than the trace is negative. So you have the trace plus the trace is positive, the trace minus the number is negative. Or if the trace were negative, then this is still positive, and a negative number plus number that's bigger than is positive. What I'm thinking a lot of words to say here is that if this is less than zero, then your eigenvalues are invalid for the time. Because this plus or minus that is always going to be larger. For example, if my numbers were three plus or minus the square root of nine minus four times negative one, let's just pretend I had some things, right? Where my trace was three and my determinant was negative one. We'll take a look at that. Three plus or minus the square root of 13. The square root of 13 is bigger than three. So when I add it, it gets more positive. When I subtract it, it gets negative enough that it's negative. And it wouldn't have mattered if my trace was positive three or negative three. Because then negative three minus root 13 is negative, and negative three plus root 13, that root 13 is big enough to overcome the negative three. So if you determine it's negative, this part gets big enough to overpower that. And so it's positive one way, negative the other way. And that's actually the only time you get a sound is if the determinant's negative. If the determinant's positive, you get other stuff. So if the determinant's positive, Everything else. Okay. Two things to think about. If the trace is positive and we're not in determined and we're not in saddle land. So we left saddle land. We're now in the land of not saddles. Meaning if you're in the land of not saddles, the eigenvalues are either the same sign right, because they can't be different signs, or they're complex. If they're complex, the real part's still the same sign. So if the trace is positive, well, if the trace is positive, that means your eigenvalues are going to have positive values. So it's going to be positive plus or minus something that's not going to make it change signs, which means we're going to have instability. And if the trace is negative, you're going to have stability. Finally, we can determine if we have spirals or nodes, wholly dependent on what's going on with this right here. So if that amount, if that's positive, then you're taking the square root of something that's positive and you have nodes. If that's negative, you have spirals. Now, the book phrases it a slightly different way. Instead of writing it like that, they write it like that. They write, so they write this as um, the determinant being less than one fourth of tau squared. And they write this as the determinant being greater than one fourth tau squared. This might seem like more work than it's worth. It's actually not. It's kind of nice to be able to do this because later on, we're going to see some matrices where it's really, really easier to look at the trace and determinant than it's trying to actually figure out the angle. So let me just show you this picture in the book because I think it's a good thing to leave you with. Here is the picture I'm talking about. So if on the y-axis you say is the determinant, so the determinant is positive up here, negative down here. On the x-axis is the trace, positive trace, negative trace. So down here where the determinant is negative, 
you're in saddle land. Saddles all down here. And then up here above, on the right, you're in unstable land. On the left, you're in stable land. And then where the trace, where the determinant is equal to one quarter of the trace squared, that's the dividing line between spirals and nodes. If you're below this line, you're a, a node, or if you're below this curve, you're a node. If you're above this curve, you're a spiral. Because if you're above this curve, you've got negatives in your square root. And if you're below this curve, you've got positive in your square root. So kind of a cool picture. I would encourage you to take a look at it here. Um, and I should stop because it's 301. It's page 650. It's, it's, the, it's the last thing before the exercise in section 10.2.